Hello, Echo fam, and welcome to Echo Online Service. We love that you are watching with us today. At Echo, it is our hope that you find your place, your people, and your purpose. So let us know you're watching by commenting below with where you're watching from. We would love to connect with you. If you're new to Echo, this is what you can expect. We'll start with a few songs of worship, listen to a message of baptism from Pastor Andy, and close with a time of response. If you call Echo home, you know our heart for living a life of generosity. We love giving to organizations with the heart of Jesus. Venture is one of those organizations. It is their mission to give justice to the unreached. They accomplish this through rescue and safety, food security, education, agribusiness, discipleship, and health and hygiene. A quick testimony of the good work that Venture is doing comes from a girl named Hannah. She was born into the lowest case in Nepal. Hannah was deemed untouchable, repeatedly told that she had no value. And now she has become the first of her people to graduate from college. Hannah said that when Venture stepped into her life, it was the first time that she felt human. If you are looking to give today, you can do so in a few different ways. You can head to our website, you can text any amount to 84321, or you can use the Church Center app. Thanks again for being a part of our Echo fam, and we hope you enjoy Echo's online service.
Father, we just come to you right now and we look up, God. God, we give you our pain. We give you our circumstances, God. I pray that for every single person who just came in this room today, God, if we feel like there are walls in front of us, God, I pray that you will remove that wall brick by brick, God, and that we can see you on the horizon, God. I pray right now for purpose. I pray for us to see past our circumstances, to see past our weakness, to see past our sin, to see past the struggles that we have come here with, God. You are a God who just wants to sit with us, God. You are our heavenly Father. You are our confidant. You are our best friend. You are our healer. God, Jesus, we just ask for you to be in this room right now. And I pray for every single room, every single person in this room right now to sense your peace. I pray for hope. I thank you for being a God that doesn't give up on us. And right now we just give you today. We pray as we step up, that we level up, that we look up, that we see you, God, that we don't have to do this alone. In your holy name, amen. And if you're watching online, we just want to uh, say what's up. We are so glad that you're joining us and that you believe in the home church and that God is not done and we're rooting for you too. So can we welcome those that are watching online church? We are in a series called Up and this idea with Up is what if we would actually listen to God, listen to Jesus and take step steps forward. And I've mentioned this a few times and I'll continue to do this during the series in a kind of repetitive way so that we might remember it, is that Jesus was teaching his disciples that he was going to go to the Father, that he was going to leave them. In fact, it was a, a pretty sad message. And I couldn't imagine being the disciples while Jesus is saying, hey, guess what? Peace out. I'm out of here. And it's going to be hard. Uh, you just, But, you know, you're gonna have, you gotta know that. And if you know that, then you might believe when it actually happens. And then at the end of that message, he looks at the disciples and he says, get up, let's get going. And I feel like that is the timely message uh, for us today. That is a timely message for us to go ahead and adopt into our life and our approach uh, with, with what's going on right now and where we need to go individually yet collectively as a church. Another verse that I just love in Acts 26, it's at the end of uh, that book of the disciples, and really it's a picture of them doing what Jesus had said, but years later, and, uh, and the author is reminding the people that are reading the audience, it says this uh, in Acts 26, verse 16, now up on your feet, I have a job for you. I have handpicked you to be a servant and a witness to what is happening today and to what I'm going to show you. I mean, I just wanna adopt that. And as I was thinking about church today, as I was just sitting back and worshiping and just in a moment of prayer, I was thinking, you know, I don't really wanna lead a church. I wanna be a part of a movement of God. Amen. I mean, honestly, leading a church just gets a little tiring. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And sometimes it feels just like, you know, just kind of repetitive, uh, a repetitive scenario. And, and I just was thinking today is, man, I want 2021 to be this memorable year where we individually yet collectively, man, we're not just doing church. We're joining what God wants to do in our life. Can I hear an amen? amen. God is calling us higher and yet he is calling us deeper. And today and for this, for the next few weeks, uh, I kind of want to look at a few of, not kind of, I, I am, I'm going to look at a few prominent mountains that we find in scripture and how those prominent mo mountains are, how they're mentioned and they're meant to have and relay prominent points. You see what I did there? 
There are mountains and there are peaks that God wants us to gravitate towards and then go, what are you actually trying to say to us when it comes to our walk with you? And really what I want to do today is this. I want to talk about this concept of when up is actually down. When up is actually down. And today I want to go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to just flip through a few of those chapters and eventually end in Mark and kind of parallel it with Jesus and what was happening in the beginning of Mark. But let me tell you a little bit about this story, and you're going to see that we're going to eventually arrive to a mountain and something. And, and it's really a place where God does something. And so what we find in Exodus chapter 6, it's the flood narrative. It's the, the story of the flood. And if you grew up in church, you heard it. If you have kids, you've probably read these stories to your children. I just don't know if you read that kid's story, if you really grasp what was going on, it always seems to be that we kind of kidify some of these biblical stories. And sometimes what we, what we do, although it's with good intent, we kind of take away the actual meaning of what's supposed to happen. Uh, and so uh, what we see in, Acts, uh, in Genesis chapter six is evil has overcome the earth. Man, it's, it's a pretty down day. In, in the earth, and, and it's just shortly after God had created it. And God decides to press reset on humanity, and he's gonna do that with a flood. I mean, it doesn't sound like a great story. It doesn't sound like one of those you know, stories you wanna read when you need to feel a little better, you know? <laughs> when you feel a little bit bad about yourself, you feel like, man, faith is a struggle, and you keep messing up. But, but what what... Just follow the story here. God sees the earth and really what's going on and how there's this pride of just like, there's this man actually that, that, that is mentioned at the beginning of Genesis. That, I mean, it's like he is prideful in how many people he kills and how many people fall at his feet and, and almost stands in this godlike figure. And God just feels like he's got to press reset. And, and I, got to, I just have to say this. How many of you are thankful that God sees the problem, but he always creates a solution? Amen. And even though it's a pretty downer kind of story at the beginning of Genesis, uh, God makes reference to walking with this man named Noah. And his solution was going to come through a person. And let me just pause here before, and it's not even my notes, but I got to tell you this. Some of you, you walked in here and you feel like your life hasn't amounted to much. But I'll tell you this, God is looking at you and hoping that you would step up and be the solution to those around you. Are you pumping me up here, church? Be careful. I might just preach long. What's cool about it is God walks with Noah and he begins to promise to Noah that he, he's going to make a covenant with Noah and he instructs them, as you know the story, he instructs them to build this boat, what we know as the ark. And Mo, uh, Noah does that and he starts creating this ark and he is mocked and he's ridiculed and he's discredited and he's canceled by the culture around him. Anybody relate? And they just, they start just like mocking them. And what we find out in Genesis 7 is the waters start falling the fl and it floods and it rains for 40 days. In Genesis chapter 7, 17, the flood was 40 days on earth and the water grew higher and floated the ark so that it was lifted up, lifted up off the earth. And so Noah and his family and the animals are, are sitting in uh, the ark or, you know, and I, I just kind of like, I always try to like put myself in that story. And, and I was thinking about like, just imagine the sounds. Imagine being in that little and uh, big enclosed space and you start feeling the shake. You start feeling, you know, the change and, and there's animals. And so there, there's, there's definite smells that are going on, right? And then as the 40 days continue to progress, I mean, just think about it. If you've ever been on a big lake and you've been on a boat, the seasickness, and you're just experiencing all these new things. And so in the process of this boat being lifted up, it's not an easy journey. Y'all get what I'm saying here? But that's where Noah is. In verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 1, it says, God remembered Noah, and he remembered every living thing and all the living livestock that was with him in the ark. 
And so God caused the wind. Interesting enough, that word for wind is the word ruach in Hebrew. It's the, it's the same word that we use for the spirit of God, okay? So God caused the spirit, the wind, to pass over the earth. And guess what? The waters begin to go down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ereb. Rested on the mountains of Ereb. Now, let me just tell you that word rested is an interesting word and it is used in another, another reference in the beginning stories of Genesis. And so what it could be saying is this, that God put this ark on Mount Ereb. Now, where it's used in in another reference is in the same way that God put Adam into the garden. So what God is trying to do here with these these words and these words uh, that maybe we don't necessarily see in the English uh, language, but he's beginning to say a story and trying to remind the listeners that what I did in the garden, I'm trying to do again. That God is in the business of pressing reset on this earth, but he hasn't given up yet. And what he's doing there is just as he sat down, as he put Adam into the garden, he is putting the ark onto this mountain. He wants to reset. He wants to go back to his, God's original plan. God wants to create a a solution. Interesting enough, he chooses water to kind of cleanse the world, right? And then this is a refresh moment for the world that God loves. God is trying to start a new story of new beginnings. Now, for those that like this kind of thing. Interesting enough, uh, Mount Ararat is believed to be on the borders of northern Iran and Turkey. And so this is close to kind of the central hub of belief, right, for the, the Israelites. Um, and it, but yet it's pretty far north. It's 845 miles away. And that's kind of where it all begins again. What I find fascinating isn't necessarily the location, although I like to geek out like that and just kind of, you know, kind of mentally know where things are happening on a map. Uh, I'm, I'm abs- absolutely fascinated with the word Mount Ararat. Ararat means the curse reversed. So just bear with me here. God chooses a man to create a vessel for salvation and he decides to put, put this ark upon the mountains of the curse reverse. I mean, this is God going, yoo <laughs> Do you see what's going on? Do you see that my intent is to always call you back to the garden? It's always to call you back to what I wanted with you in the first place, and that is to walk in the midst of you, to have a relationship with you, and to give you a fresh start. This is where it all happens. Let me just remind you that God is in the business of reversing the curse, and we do not. We can't. Let me just... Insert a thought. The longer we follow Jesus, the more entitled we become. Yes, we built the boat, okay? We got into the boat. Let me remind you that you didn't save yourself. God did, right? Your boat can't float unless God is on your side. I mean, just think about it. I mean, he... he, (laughs) <laughs> Just think about the chaotic waters and all, this th- all these things changing and all the dynamics that could have happened but didn't happen. And I believe because God was along the journey with Noah. And so there Noah is. He's up on this mountain. And the very next thing that Noah decides to do is he sends out 
these birds. Interesting enough, he sends out the raven first, which is kind of a self-sustaining type of uh, you know, animal that, that doesn't really need much. If you start looking into the symbolism, it's actually this symbolism of evil. That, that, and again, I don't know if you really need to go there, but this idea is the raven is sent out. It's this self-sustaining animal that can come and go and just go ahead and feast on, on meat and, and flesh and whatever might be floating. And, and so that, that is sent out. But then Noah does something interesting. He sends out the dove. And he does it three times. And in verse 8 of chapter 8, it says, Then he sent out the dove to see if the waters had gone down from the surface of the ground. And when it was the right time, God said to Noah, go out from the ark. And when he went out of that ark in the process of that, it said, God blessed Noah and his sons. And he said this, be fruitful and multiply on the earth. I'm talk- I want to talk about this journey to the top of Mount Ararat because I believe it directly parallels with what God wants to do in our life. Some of those subtle details of the story is what we should expect on the journey going up. But I have to tell you this, God's journey and his intent for us to go deeper in him, yet higher in in our journey and understanding and experience of the God of the universe and having a personal relationship with him is not meant just to be and stay on top of the mountain. God calls us to go up that we might go down. And so that's where Noah is. He's on the top of the world, right? He's on top of this mountain and God calls him out. See, they were lifted up to be put down. Our pursuit of up is meant to lead us back down. And I believe our faithfulness in the journey up will help sustain us as we go down. What goes up? And faith-wise, should come down. I believe that's just a natural progression. Well, everybody say, when up is down. I want to connect some dots. Turn, turn to uh, Mark chapter 1. Chapter 9. This is a ref- reference of Jesus and his baptism. And I just want to go ahead and just make reference uh, and just give you a little warning and just a heads up of, of when I read this, try to catch the subtle details that directly relate to the flood, directly relate to what we just talked about. Mark chapter one, verse nine says, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. That's the Jordan River into the waters. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending, him, descending on him like what? A dove. And then a voice came from heaven and said, you are my son whom I love and with you I am well pleased. And at once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness I believe Jesus' baptism is an illustration of the flood narrative. That this is a specific uh, decision for him to come in to illustrate that he is going to be the new vessel for salvation. That Jesus is the modern day ark. That we don't need to build a boat to find salvation, but we have to put our hope in the one who goes in the water for us. And so Jesus, he's lowered into the waters to come up with us. See, I believe that God wants to flood your life. I believe that God desires to give us a reset. And like I said, the longer we walk with Jesus, it just becomes naturally uh, harder to not feel entitled or to just bring and carry some religious weight along the journey. And so when I say we need a reset, I believe it is the sinner that needs a reset, reset, and it is also the saint. 
And I just don't want to be a church that, 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 that holds up our head and our chins up high because we're serious about Jesus. So much so that we become entitled and we have this expectation that our life should be like this and we should be like that and those people should be like that. I just want to remind us from time to time that we're all on the journey up and we need that salvation too. See, I believe that God wants to do a reset. God wants to flood your Life And what I want to do is go ahead and just make four um, observations of the flood and the baptism and baptism with Jesus and how it could apply to our faith. Number one, I believe Jesus calls us into the waters. Like I mentioned already, the ark is a vessel, but instead of a wooden ark, Jesus is that Ark. He desires to provide a rescue. He desires to bring salvation beyond yourself. We can work and we can dig and we can build and, and we can strive and you will never reach the heights that God can get you to. If we follow Jesus, if we are following Jesus, then I, in my mind, when he starts referencing Jesus being baptized, maybe this is a good reminder that if Jesus did it, maybe we should do it also. If we're following Jesus, then maybe we should do what Jesus has done. And again, I just think about this idea of Jesus calling us into the waters. I think about this story of Noah and the ark. And I think about that moment of getting into that ark, stepping into the waters. When I'm talking, some of you that have not yet been baptized, it's, it's a scary idea of, of submitting yourself, humbling yourself. And, and I think it actually gets harder the older we get. I think of a previous experience of ministry and, and uh, we were doing a baptism Sunday and I got a phone call from my 92 year old friend. I said, Andy, I feel like I need to go into the waters. And I'd known him for 15 years and I was like, hey, if anybody needs to go in the waters and be baptized by someone, it's me and you should baptize me. I don't know what was going on in his spirit, but he looked at me and I said, are you sure you really, he, by the way, he's blind and he can barely hear and he can barely walk. And I, I was trying to make it easy for him. And I said, Jim, I said, if, if you want to do that, you know, we can come up with some other options. You don't have to go down into the tub. It won't be very difficult for you. And he looked at me and he said, Andy, stop that. He's like, I'm going into the waters. I'm going into the waters. And, 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 and you know what? He has inspired me and I will tell this story for the rest of my life because guess what? It is a scary thing to follow Jesus. Many of you struggle with this idea. You, you have a level of like uh, excuse. You have a level of reasoning on why you shouldn't go into the waters. But I, I just want to honestly be really, really brutally like frank with you. Like maybe you should go into the waters if you're feeling that way. And I'll say this, um, if you're following Jesus and his direction has never made you feel anxious or nervous, maybe you've never followed Jesus in the first place. Let that one sit. If we've been following Jesus and we've never felt the tension of taking a next step, we might be following a different Jesus. Jesus loves, I can't look at you because that's such a strong statement. <clears throat> Jesus loves you and Jesus cares for you, but he cares and loves you so much that he doesn't want to leave you where you are. I think, let that sink in. I'm telling you, man, get up. Refuse, refuse to stay where you are. 
in the teachings of Jesus, baptism is that. He's calling us into the waters. That is what he calls us to do. And, and I don't know what it is, but there's something special when we put a physical step that aligns with the spiritual movement within us. And I believe baptism is that physical step. Number two, in reference to the flood and Jesus's baptism, as we step into those water, waters, God calls us under the flood, he calls us to go underneath the rains. In baptism, he calls us to go under the water. And that's to remind us that God desires a reset. And that reset requires a trust moment. It requires this phys physical action that just begins to prove this inward confidence that God is building in our life. God calls us up. That's the, second, the third notion of baptism and the flood. God is calling us up. Up is movement, it's not a stagnation. God calls us into the waters. God calls us under, and he doesn't want us just to stay there. I mean, that would be the easiest ministry ever if we were just like, you just stay there. God calls us to movement. He calls us to renewal. He calls us to restoration. He wants to reap in your life. God calls us up. And if you can just think about it, when you jump into the lake, you jump into the pool and, and you go underneath the water for the first time, that first breath out of that water is the most uh, memorable breath, right? Because it just, it takes so much to gather that oxygen back. And I believe when we come out of the water that that is that moment where he brings life that he wants to breathe a brand new breath within us, but he also wants to invite us at that moment in that movement to go deeper and yet higher. One of my favorite authors is a man, last name man named Foster, and he writes a book on prayer it's titled, Finding the Heart's True Home. And he says this, God is inviting us deeper in and higher up. There is training in righteousness, transforming power. There's a new joy and there's a deeper intimacy. And sometimes the very things that we relinquish is given back to us. And I think when we submit ourselves to the waters, that that is a moment when we come back up, that's when we commit to Lord, make us righteous. Show us a joy that we've never experienced before. Renew me, restore me, bring me to the life that you desire for me to live. And number four, God doesn't call us to stay in the ark and he doesn't call us to stay in the waters. He calls us out. God calls us to the mountain that we might go back down to repeat what he's done in us. He's called us to be fruitful. He's called us to multiply and he's called us to fill the earth with what God has filled within us. Baptism and the flood is this picture of movement. It's, it's, it's this picture of God renewing and restoring, not so that we might just be restored, but we might go and bring that to the earth and the world and the, the workspace and the home that we live in, that we work in, where we breathe. See, he's calling us up the mountain, but he's calling us down to share what God has done in us. Jesus is calling us up. And I believe obedience is that first step. For some of us, God's asking you to take a step of obedience and he's done that for years. And you're sitting here today and you feel a little bad. 
That's not what God wants you to feel. But he is still waiting for you. Jesus is still calling you. Jesus is still desiring breakthrough in your life. rubber hits the road right here. Maybe some of you, you've justified the reasons why not to be faithful in going into the waters for years. And in your own mind, you've ridiculed this idea. You've kind of broken it down why you shouldn't do that. And I'm just trying to tell you today, maybe just possibly if you step into the waters that maybe when you come up out of that water that Jesus would tell you what your next step is. The waters isn't everything. I'll tell you what, this is not a salvation thing. This is a following thing. There's nothing significant about the water. It's significant in being obedient with what God said to do. And some of you are like, man, you are straightforward today. I'm sorry, it's what the Bible says. I want to tell you today, up is an action. Up is a decision. Up is a direction. And today, Jesus is trying to say, listen up. And now let your heart move your feet. Let those ears help you take a neck next step. Let's make today the day that we set aside excuses. Let today be the day we set aside regrets. Let us receive the reset that God wants to do in and through us today. Will you just close your eyes? Will you just bow your heads? Just as Noah opened up the window of the ark and he let out the dove, which symbolizes the spirit over the chaotic waters of the life, the life, the new life of the world. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water and the spirit came down as a dove, the Spirit wants to hover over us today and begin to do His movement in us. And some of us, we've been baptized. We've gone in the waters, but since, we, and, but since then, we have strayed. God wants to remind us to continue that upward journey to the greater calling that He has for us. And I just want to welcome the Spirit to to come into this place, to remind us about our calling, to remind us about our following, to remind us what that next step might be. Jesus, today, we want more. Right now, we lay aside man's wisdoms and man's wisdom and man's power. We want you to speak. Today, God, I just ask that you would convict today. God, God, I I feel like God is giving me this image that some of us, we've jumped into the ark, but we've carried all the old things from the past in there, trying to take and receive a rescue, but also carrying our baggage. And some of you today is a day that you say, Lord, have it all. Jesus, today, would you speak to us? Would you lead us? At the end of Mark chapter 16, Jesus, as he's about to ascend to heaven, says, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. 
whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe will be condemned. Let us be people who believe and that are baptized. It's not a salvation thing. It is a following thing. And Jesus is calling us to step up, to step out, to listen up and be the people of obedience that God has ordained us to be. Will you stand up in this place? Some of you, you hear about Jesus and it's a new concept. There's some new thoughts. And for some of you here, maybe a lot of work, but I wanna remind you that the salvation that Jesus provides is free. It's called grace. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it, but Jesus gives it. I think it's illustrated when Jesus comes up out of the water and the voice from heaven says, this is my son who I am well pleased. It was before Jesus did anything earthly on his ministry to earn that salvation. Jesus is saying that over you today. He's saying, I am well pleased, but will you come to me? Will you open your hands? Will you receive that salvation? Would you follow the person who wants to save you? And today, like we do every week, we pray a prayer that really is just our commitment to say, Jesus, we can't do this, but you can. We're gonna surrender and will you do your work in us today? I'm gonna ask that you would pray this with me today. Church, let's do this as we join those who are praying for the very first time. Jesus, I surrender. I have more questions than answers, but I choose to follow you anyway. I acknowledge that you lived, you died, and you rose again, all with us in mind. I accept the rescue that you offer. Save me and lead me in Jesus' name and his authority. And everybody said, I invite you as we sing this new song, to position your heart to receive as the Lord and the Holy Spirit does his work in and through you. Amen.
is our declaration in this place this morning, church. We submitted to Him in this moment. God, we are so glad that you are the refiner, that you are not done with us, that you are working through us and that you are drawing us closer to you. Let today be a moment where we took one more step of obedience towards who you've called us to be. God, we love you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been thinking about this year so far, and it seems like God's calling us, maybe as a church, maybe I'm just feeling this, but in a step of obedience, it feels like God's kind of calling us out a little bit. Hey, take this step, do this thing. And what I've realized is we're trying to, as a church, help you on your faith journey, more though than just Sunday mornings. On that 
road to restoration outside of these walls in your daily life. Those steps of obedience look different, but I'm going to challenge you with two of them today. One of them you heard a lot about today. Take that step of obedience in baptism. Now, Baptism Flood Sunday is March 21st. Reach out to the church. Now, listen, in the next four weeks, you are going to talk yourself into it and out of it like 12 times. If you're like me, maybe more times. But I believe that God is calling a lot of us in this room to take that step. If you call yourself a Christian, you say you follow Jesus, let's take the next step. Let's be obedient in that. Now, obedience is a word we in America don't love. We don't like being told what to do. I'm my own man. I get to make my own decision. You know, think about those cultural things that we've got to take a step against, fight against, lay down our pride, and be reminded it's about Jesus and not about us. Another challenge I'm going to give you is this. I believe we carry the weight of the world on our shoulders a lot of times. So the last two weeks, you heard a little bit about Sabbath. I think taking Sabbath is one of those steps where you kind of are reminded that the weight of the world is not you. Another one of those obedient steps that I'm going to challenge you with today is give. Give for the first time, give for the next time. But that first time, I want to speak to you guys that maybe have never given before. Never invested in a church, never, never laid down that part of your life before. There is a power and an encouragement when you let go a little bit. When you let go just a little bit, you loosen that hand on this planet, on this earth, just a little bit and start living for something more than yourself. So those two steps, let's take a step in baptism. If you haven't done that yet, do that. And if you've been taking a step in giving yet, I would just encourage you, not because of what it'll do for the church, but because of what it'll do for you and your walk. Now, we like to do something here. We like to celebrate. So can we celebrate two groups of people? Will you guys do this with me? There's two groups I want to celebrate. One is I know there's some people that maybe said that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time. And the second one is anybody new to Echo. Will you guys celebrate with me any of those people in the room today? Come on. <laughs> 